Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Adkins, and uh, this is Paul Midgen. Uh, we're both members of DMARC.org, which is the, the organization that created and continues to shepherd the DMARC specification. Uh, and today, we are going to be talking about DMARC, hopefully telling you everything you want or need to know about it. Um, if during the course of this uh, you have any questions, please do raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone around to you. Um, and away we go. This is the standard uh, attendees reminder for all MOG meetings. Everyone should be uh, fairly familiar with it at this point. Um, basically, no, no communicating uh, outside of the membership, anything that is discussed at MOG. Uh, that includes uh, people um, using things like uh, social media or taking photographs or sending emails around or things like that, please let's, let's keep uh, MOG information confidential. It's one of the things that gives value to membership. So here's a, here's, here's a rough outline of our uh, session today. We're gonna start out with a quick introduction to DMARC, its history, goals, scope, et cetera. Then we're gonna go on to an overview of the spec. We're gonna teach you guys the, the nuts and bolts of how DMARC works and what the important technical concepts in the spec are and what you have to do to implement it and participate. Then for the second part, we're gonna break up into two groups based on primarily what your, your area of business or interest in, in DMARC is, so we can do a little bit more of a deep dive on what uh, that particular side of the equation looks like. Things we will not cover. Um, these, are, these are things that you will not find in the content of this session. If this is information you're looking for, uh, I apologize in advance. We're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about why phishing is a problem. We assume that if you're a MOG member and you're here for DMARC training, um, you're already familiar with it. Uh, perhaps your, your organization is, is suffering under it. Um, and we shouldn't have to talk about it too much. Uh, we're not gonna go into the details of how the underlying email domain authentication mechanisms are uh, implemented or how they work or what you need to implement those. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about how to do DKIM or SPF. Uh, we're not gonna talk much about the internals of DNS and how those things work or SMTP or, or XML. These are all underlying technologies that DMARC um, utilizes in, in some form and we assume at least enough familiarity to understand the, the, the DMARC spec with them. So we're not gonna do too much of a deep dive on any of those. Um, we're not going to spend much time talking about um, uh, what we call cousin, do cousin domains or, or similarly named domains because that's a, a type of phishing that DMARC does not attempt to combat um, or what to do about the display name field or really anything about uh, MUA advice or, or things that show up in mail clients because those are again things that the DMARC spec doesn't address. Uh, and we're also not going to talk about how to go about doing things like phishing investigations or takedown services of, of phishing websites. Um, that's something that the data that DMARC enables the, the collection of might power at your companies, but exactly how to do that is not something that we're gonna go into. Um, so how many people here in the audience work for an organization that's mainly a mailbox provider? You're an ISP, a webmail provider, something like that. That is maybe a quarter of the room, okay. How many folks here consider themselves a domain or brand owner? You run some sort of business that sends transactional or marketing mail for yourself. You don't send mail for other people, okay. A few folks in the back. Um, how many of you guys use third parties to send some of your mail? Or do you just send it all yourself? Okay. Uh, and how many folks in here are actually uh, third party senders, either a cloud hosting provider, dedicated hosting provider, ESP, something like that? That's about half of the room. Okay, so the biggest demographic is um, therefore DSP, ESPs and domain owners. So when we do the breakout, uh, that means anyone who is either a domain owner, brand, or ESP will be going to the larger breakout room. That is going to be holiday four. We're going to repeat that. So when we get to the middle and we split up, everybody who's in that constituency uh, can go to the other room during that break. And with that, I will turn it over to Paul. Hi, everybody. So we're talking about DMARC, and for those of you who haven't attended one of our, our prior trainings, I think this is uh, the fourth or fifth time we've done it now. We've sort of done it all over the world and uh, several times in the U.S. Um, the thing that we're trying to do is really kind of demystify it and educate people on how it relates to the other authentication protocols that are already in use for email. Um, so with that sort of as the backdrop, the goal of DMARC is not to introduce a new type of way to validate email in the sense of what SPF and DKIM do. Rather, it leverages those already. Um, one of the sort of fundamental principles behind D, uh, DMARC is to sort of make better use of what's, what people have already been working to deploy for several years now. So if you have, if you're a sender or you're a receiver and you have an existing investment, 
in deploying DKIM and SPF, DMARC helps you get more out of that. Um, the other thing that it wants to do is provide sort of a window into what actually happens to your mail as a sender when you start hitting different domains on the receiving side that are capable of doing DMARC verification of your messages. So baked into the format for DMARC records into the standard itself is the notion of reporting. Um, the final thing is that uh, if, if you've played around with SPF and DKIM, you know that they don't always necessarily operate on the same identity within the mail. So if you have, for a given message, an SPF result and a DKIM result, you don't know um, that they actually are relating to the same domain or address within the mail. SPF typically works on the envelope. DKIM can work on just about anything. Um, there's a special case of DKIM, which we refer to as the author domain signature, which means that the domain you see in the from header and the message that the recipient reads is the, mess is the uh, domain mentioned in the D equals field in DKIM. So you, you don't always know that that's going to be the case, but under DMARC, it, the mechanism is provided to relate those results. So DMARC is actually not something that just kind of sprang into being. A bunch of us didn't get together one day and just decide, you know, there was nothing interesting going on in email authentication, so we just do something new. Um, it sprang forth out of an effort uh, previously known as MooCow. Um, which was basically an informal working group of senders and receivers that had noticed, you know, hey, there's this problem, we want to work together to try to solve it, and so it was what we called private channel arrangements, where the only way for you to participate was if you knew somebody at one of the participating uh, sender side or receiver side folks, you would contact them, you would make an arrangement, and then the rules for handling mail and authentication that eventually became DMARC would be subject to your mail streams. Um, that private channel effort was successful enough that the group decided to make the thing public and take on additional membership, do press releases, devise a public standard, and kind of start marching towards eventual standards track for this, for this work. Um, sort of as I've mentioned, uh, one of the goals of this was to standardize the way that DKIM and SPF were used, because without sort of a, a policy layer on top of those things, you're, you're kind of left up to your own as a receiver to decide what to do with the results you get when you validate DKIM or SPF. Um, the reporting piece, just born out of our operational experience, when we started sending each other reports, uh, the early participants in the efforts, who I mean when I refer to we, uh, there was a lot to be learned there. I mean, the initial purpose was to figure out, like, hey, are you authenticating my mail correctly, and what happens if you reject mail from me? But what we discovered also was that there was a huge amount of intel, intelligence provided into phishing and other abuses of domains. Um, because DMARC operates on top of SPF and DKIM, you, you can't do DMARC without having deployed support for those other authentication protocols. Um, we wanted, as part of our work, to get more people in the ecosystem to authenticate their mail. Um, and in fact, that's kind of, you go to the, this training today, there's another talk on Thursday about DMARC. Um, one of the messages that we try to weave whenever we talk about DMARC is, even if you're just here to learn about DMARC, if you do nothing else when you leave here, deploy SPF and DKIM. Like, at least start authenticating your mail streams, because that's kind of the first step. Um, and finally, as we'll get into with some of the examples and as we walk through the policy spec, there are a number of levels that, D, that DMARC can be operated at. It ranges all the way from having a reporting level function to actually changing the delivery disposition of your mail. So there's a, there's a number of different ways you can run DMARC, and of course, one of our goals in doing this training and helping people understand how it works, how to sort of analyze how it impacts your mail stream, is to take you from that reporting only mode all the way up to a mode where the receiver can reject messages from you that fail to check. Um, that, that said, uh, we've kind of before in a cavalier way made the statement like, we want to reject all the mail that gets sent. That's not true and it freaks people out. That's not really the goal. The goal of DMARC is not to throw your mail away. It's a, it's a tool for helping receivers sort the wheat from the chaff and we'll kind of get into a little bit later on how that's done. Um, so, there are some things that DMARC doesn't do. Uh, 
Uh, did I go the right way? Yeah. Um, Mike's mentioned a few of these already. Uh, cousin domain abuse or homograph type attacks where somebody replaces a lowercase l with an i. DMARC does not do anything with that. It, we don't talk about it in the spec. It's just an issue that this effort is not designed to address. Um, display name abuse, so the friendly portion that gets displayed in your, your mail reader. You know, people can put whatever they want in there. DMARC does not have any bearing on how that field is handled. It's, it kind of falls into the category of the mail user agent, what kind of policy they want to apply there. Um, to that end, and just to drive the point home, we don't make any recommendations towards people who are build email readers. So if there's anybody from the sort of Gmail UX development team in here, the Outlook team, or uh, Thunderbird, we do nothing in the spec that makes recommendations as to what you should do. Um, that's not to sort of downplay the significance of how you render mail and what you show to users. It's just that this being an iterative effort, the first standard is to kind of secure and instrument the underlying email stream and get people doing that and learning about how their mail performs before we kind of take the next step. Um, it's an open issue for now. Uh, DMARC, we don't call it an enterprise security solution. I mean, we're not going to, we don't envision anybody building an appliance out of this thing. It's not something that takes the place of other enterprise level security protocols. It's just another piece. It's a policy layer that works with email. Um, it's not an incident response tool. So there's, there's nothing in the protocol definition itself that you would use or would supplant, an, an, again, an existing sort of security incident response team or response plan. Um, you'll have some data at your disposal because of reporting and the other uh, information you get out of this that could inform those efforts. But in and of itself, it doesn't prescribe any kind of a standard practice there. Um, and finally, it, when people hear about, oh, DMARC does reporting and it reports on the sort of disposition of messages, it's reporting on the negative side of disposition. So if because of DMARC we're rejecting or quarantining mail, you'll find that information in the aggregate logs or the aggregate reports that DMARC sends. What it won't tell you is a receiver is not going to tell you what percentage of your mail went to the spam folder versus the inbox or was foldered by users. It doesn't tell you what they read and didn't read or what they deleted. This is purely based on the outcome of the operation of the underlying e email authentication and then the evaluation of the DMARC policy itself. So just to give you a little bit of an idea how long it's been going. Um, the first private prototype was built and deployed in 2007. This is really where we started gaining sort of what we refer to now as the operational experience behind DMARC. Um, that lesson was powerful enough that the folks who were engaged in that began reaching out to others and said, hey, we've got this really cool thing. Come and participate. Um, that led into the effort that became DMARC.org, and we started seeing more uptake on the receiver side, on the sender side, and we started seeing vendors at kind of all points in the email ecosystem start developing, whether it was like report analytics or you know, they were including support in their, uh, their MTA products or other products. We started to see that kind of ramp. Um, and then in February 11 was when the actual first DMARC records in the form that you see them now were published. And so, you know, that's, that's grown from maybe one receiver side uh, processor of DMARC and one sender side publishing an actual DMARC conformant record to now we find dozens or hundreds of these things. Um, 2012 was kind of the banner year for us. It sort of was our coming out party. Uh, we, in January, we had an official press launch of the first public draft of the, of the spec, and that meant that anybody could participate now. We formed a discussion list called DMARC Discuss uh, up on DMARC.org. So anyone who was interested could take a look at the spec, could comment on it, make suggestions. They could deploy and begin sharing their experience with us. Um, and then this summer, uh, we held an interop event where people from all over the world, all over the United States, came over, everybody from the sending side to analytics to MTA vendors and receivers all participated in this event. And it was basically a, you know, a two-day bug bash of the spec in person. It was pretty cool. Uh, the, the steps left for us uh, are we, uh, when we went public, we also sort of opened up our bug database. Now anybody participating on DMARC Discuss who's either building an implementation or interoperating with one can file bugs with us. 
So we're kind of going through the massive backlog of bugs and figuring out what will make it into the spec and what won't. And all of this culminates, we think, early to mid next year uh, with a formation of an IETF working group and it's an introduction of the draft that is locked at that time as kind of the seed document for that effort. Um, in which case, uh, the sort of like private working group, that's the, the dev group within dmark.org will be opened up into a formal IETF working group. 